Hey everyone, you found episode 3 of our new podcast, Exploring Kodawari. If you haven't heard the term, Kodawari is a Japanese concept word which essentially means pursuing perfection in a craft, or perhaps more generally in life. But embedded in the meaning of this word is the knowledge that you can't actually reach that perfection. Like, obviously you can't reach that perfection. But it's the honest attempt that gives life meaning. I think any music performer can relate to that fact. Anyways, our guest for this episode is a perfect example of someone who exudes the Kodawari energy. Her name is Chris Quapis, and she is an expert in early music and the Baroque trumpet. She appears regularly as a soloist and principal trumpet in period instrument ensembles across North America, and she teaches Baroque trumpet at Indiana University's Jacobs School of Music. Her bio is way too long to read here, so I encourage you to check it out on her website, which I linked in the episode notes. For non-music geeks listening, this means that she specializes in early music, music from the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, more specifically, music written for the trumpets of those time periods. But more generally, she's just an inspiring person. And in fact, when I was a young lad in high school, around 2005, she was living in New York and I randomly began trumpet lessons with her. Within about a few months, I, I think, I had edited my whole life path and decided to pursue music performance. Um, in this episode, we talk about many things, including what it means to be an artist, how to prepare for concerts, how to balance technique and artistic expression, in other words, how do we transcend technique and just surrender to the artistic expression of being a performer? And we also talk about life philosophy more generally, especially as musicians who aren't able to perform during the coronavirus pandemic. Those kinds of deep questions have been on all of our minds, I think. Anyways, it was a fun and meaningful conversation, and we hope you enjoy it. All right, we're going. Chris, welcome to Exploring Kodawari. We don't even know exactly what this is yet, but, you know, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Either do I. <laughs> so I will have um, introduced you already a little bit in the introduction, um, but do you want to just tell people who you are, what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Chris Quapis, and for the most part, I am a Baroque trumpet specialist, and that's uh, mostly how I spend my time and energy and thoughts. But in addition to that, I um, live a life and I, <laughs> what? I garden and I cook and uh, I do things like that. I paint a little bit and uh, obsess about the state of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Which is way too easy to do during <laughs> All um, of us, I guess. COVID-19. Absolutely. How, how have you Absolutely. before? Let's just get that part out of the way. Like, how have you been dealing with that as a human, as a musician? It hit musicians weird, I think, right? Yeah, I totally think it did. In in some ways, uh, it feels like was it all a dream? Right? Like, did did were there were there the olden times when we would play concerts and yeah. and gather together and think nothing of it, or and, go to the uh, grocery store and not be so aware of your hands, <laughs> <laughs> or yes. make or lists on your phone? Be aware of your hands. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it did. It hit me. It hit, I guess probably for for so many of us musicians, especially who are used to doing at least having part of our lives that are exceedingly public, uh, where we're out and we're playing concerts and we're talking to people, and um, and then there's that other half of most of our lives where we're in a in a small room practicing and doing our own thing and. But I think there was that balance. Right, uh, yeah. And that I, I feel like for me especially, I feel like the first the first few weeks were kind of um, relaxing or in a, in a weird way because I'm used to being on the road so much and my la and fall was super busy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it was just so nice to actually be in the same place at my home for more than one one day or two days in a row so yeah but then it, then it started to get a little bit um, <laughs> got old strange. real fast <laughs> yeah yeah we loved the first we were like going on walks and it was like you know yeah. all this spaciousness 
And then and then it was like, oh, this is going to be a while, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would grab like yeah. technique books and start practicing. I'm going to finish this one and that one. And I, just like nothing's happening, basically. <laughs> just like, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to see you violin. Yeah. Like, it's been weird. I guess. Yeah, I found I found it strange, too, that uh, throughout the rest of my life, um, practicing was never something that I needed to work up the... Uh, the courage or ambition to have it was just always there and you know maybe it was just the fear of knowing that a performance was coming up or something definitely that plays a role like for mm -hmm. motivation um you know you don't want to embarrass yourself by looking like a fool (laughs) um (laughs) I'll, i'll even if i have an advanced student working on a concerto i haven't played in years i'll you know work on that or whatever just so that i don't but um now I find myself in practicing just wandering. Like, I'll be like, yeah. oh, today I'm going to practice, but I warmed up, so I guess I'll play through a concerto. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. just yeah. to get something on, on your face and get some some time playing, but it's really hard to, like, because, I mean, what, the New York Phil just announced they canceled their whole fall season. I'm sure a lot of orchestras will follow that in, in with over the summer. So it's like, yeah, when when you don't have any near-term goals, the, the whole project, it starts to, you know, get unstable. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's interesting because like I said, uh, that's, a, I've, it's never been even something that I've thought about because there's always been something, you know, even when you were in seventh grade, there's always something coming up solo and ensemble or, right, right. Mm-hmm. you know, that old yeah, seventh grade and, band uh, solo. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, my first one, I it was in ninth grade when I was getting a little more geeky about trumpet and it was just an offstage solo that was like a C scale, basically. <laughs> and I was just like so prepared for that. <laughs> yes. Well, I think I, I think I remember. I think I remember you right around that same time. Right. So. That's when we started lessons. I think uh, it was tenth yeah. grade. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I can't. I and to think that I thought I knew how to play trumpet then. I wonder what ten me ten years from me now will think, but you know. Yeah, well, I think I think the curve changes over time. Too. Yeah. So, what else have you been up to then, um, other than music? Have you been keeping busy with productive things or whatever? Yeah, I f- I feel like I kind of go in waves as well with that too. Um, lots of gardening type projects and and taking care of uh, a number of little to do list things that. I've wanted to do, but usually I had the good excuse of not being actually at home yeah, to, yeah. to do work or cleaning or things right. like that. Um, painting some, I do some painting. And so um, that's been kind of, that's been kind of a nice the encaustic, distraction. Right? Yeah. Encaustic yeah. painting. Yeah. I was just showing her on your right. website, some of those. Yeah. It's beautiful stuff. Really. I've been well, thank you. looking at it. Yeah. A lot of waves. Yeah, it's it's a kind of an interesting thing because it's uh I feel like it is so much more uh improvisatory just because of the nature of using the medium which is wax and you have to use a um torch to to burn each layer in and who knows what will happen sometimes even if you have really good control. And I think, in a way, music or life is like that. Yeah, is, it, it's, it's similar. It's preparation that. plus randomness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I love about performing music is, um, however much you prepare in the moment, it's it's a bit random. I mean, not randomness totally, but randomness is there playing its part a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think when I was younger, I rejected that you know, and then it causes stiffness and, and stuff. And when I, you just embrace the randomness, even if it's only 10% or 15%, things free up. You just go, ah, whatever. Yes. Yeah. Well, isn't that, <laughs> you know, and I think that's, I think that's a life lesson too, because I think, um, uh, if, if we, if we stay, if we stay too focused on a specific goal or, a specific, a specific idea, I think, especially of what we think our life is supposed to be, mm-hmm. then I, we, you know, we miss out on, on, on maybe what it's really supposed to be, right? Mm-hmm. Which maybe is supposed to stay somewhat mysterious or something. 
Indeed. You know, like if you could define it perfectly, then what would that mean? Like, you know, then just be that, you know, it's like here would be right. the ideal version of me in my life. It's like, well, then why aren't you doing it? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, yeah, that that sounds like a lot of pressure, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It would be too much pressure to even know. Would, wouldn't you just be a god or something? <laughs> Uh, well, maybe one of us will find out sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we are trumpet players, right? <laughs> well, sure. Good point. Uh, so what... Baked in. What do you think uh, for, like, non-musician listeners, like, uh, I think musicians, we all have a... Musicians who make it to a certain level all have a similar work ethic. I'm not quite sure where it comes from. I think I had it before music because I... Did that when I played lacrosse. I was up at the school throwing the ball against the wall for three hours while other people might not have been. Um, mm -hmm. I was just a kid. I don't know why I was doing it. It was probably just like, this seems better than other stuff I could do. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I'm not sure if, if music is why people work hard, but it seems to be that for musicians to get past like grad school and be, become a professional, you have to be the kind of person that can grind it out for three hours a day certainly at least when you're developing your skills in, in school. But, you know, I, I don't know if I practice three hours a day when I'm playing concerts, but it's more like you practice enough every day. It's it's on vacations, you bring at least your mouthpiece to stay in, like that kind of stuff that other people would be like, just leave your work at home. It's like, eh, because when vacation ends, there's a concert that week, so I can't, you know. So where do you yeah, think that motivation that comes consistency. from? Consistency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the motivation... Um... Yeah, it probably comes partly from that, but I guess this is where where you start thinking about well, um, you know, that idea of of what is the difference between playing and uh, working, and uh, you know, I guess there's there's some saying you can look it up, or uh, but it's something like, you know, it's it's the the master is the one who has. Um, uh, has been able to figure out how play and work are one and the same and indistinguishable mm -hmm. so that so that when you work hard it's it's also a, a form of play right and, yeah um, and not just playing like an instrument but well the word know, just play mentally. has been uh, you know people interpret it to mean i think like like play like not try at something or but like you can play a board game and really play it you know like <laughs> Or you could just be like not paying attention. You know, if you've ever been to a board game night, you always have like the people who halfway through abandon it, you know, Cause, <laughs> and then yes. you have the people who are like, no, no, no I'm in this. Like, <laughs> no, we are done. I don't care if this takes all night. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I guess, I guess probably I bet you would find most musicians are in that category. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I, guess. I mean, it's certainly at some point I there's that feeling of like, this is an interesting problem to solve, like learning how to articulate correctly or bow correctly on a violin. Yeah. Um, there's that at least like problem solver technical part. And then it, I think later comes the more artistic part. How did you get into mm -hmm. music? Like what, was there like a moment that kind of sparked you or were, was it earlier in life? Like for Yanka, what were you? Six when, six when she was set on the path to become a violinist, you know? Yeah, it was a That's bit. very different from me, which was like, we started lessons in 10th grade, and I was like, you can go to college for music? What? <laughs> and I was like, but wow, I don't want to teach six? band. You're like, no, you could play. You could just do yeah. that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, oh. there there is a, just the one option. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I felt like it was important to pay that that concept forward because when I was your age, I thought that was the only option as well as to yeah. be a band director and not that there's anything wrong with that, but plenty of good ones, plenty of bad ones, like it. any other job. <laughs> yeah. Right. Of course. Of course. I yeah. remember my mom, when you started teaching me lessons, she was like, she's a doctor of the trumpet. What does that mean? You know, <laughs> I was like, I don't really know. <laughs> I'm in 10th grade. So I prescribed you some etudes. Yeah, and... something like that. Yeah. Because I didn't think, I was like, what, like, what could you possibly, what detail could you learn about the trumpet to be a doctor of it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know in, in, in many ways, I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so for people who don't know, there's like the PhD path, like, and then for musicians who are in performance, it's called a Doctor of Musical Arts, DMA. So it's a slightly different thing than if you were getting a PhD in 
composition or other musical history fields or something because mm -hmm. it it well it depends where you go in terms of how it splits the performing part and the academic part i know some schools are yeah more... that's true and yeah sorry i didn't mean to cut up but yeah some schools call it a, a doctorate of music or yeah and and i think it's what's interesting is for a doctorate, it can be very different at, at different schools, like how much performance and how much academic yeah. and some schools require a dissertation, a formal dissertation. In some schools, you just have to submit documents. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's quite various. Yeah. It, I, but I, I, I certainly didn't know that that was a thing when I when I started playing trumpet. Yeah, exactly. In, yeah. When I was 10. <laughs> um, so. uh were you were you later in high school or earlier in middle school? Like, at what point did you go, I'm doing music? Well, it was pretty early on. I started I started playing in band in fifth grade and uh, like I literally couldn't wait. Mm -hmm. I I kept asking about it. I just I couldn't wait to play something. And um, and I ended up playing trumpet just because my cousin had one. And yeah, that's always the reason, right? Like some random so thing, kind of and now me. it's what you do, yeah. <laughs> right? And now I. Touch what if your it cousin had a saxophone? Like, would you ever thought about that? I know, <laughs> alternate universe. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just I couldn't wait, and then in fifth grade I started playing and um, had a really great band director, um, who I'm in contact with on a regular basis still. Uh, luckily for me. Um, and yeah, I, I went away to, I got a scholarship to go to Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp in Michigan, where oh, I grew I, up. I know and, that, uh, that camp. Yeah, Blue Lake. And so I got a scholarship there. I think it was uh, the summer of, it was either sixth or, I think it was seventh grade. And it was actually the very, I still remember this very clearly, my rehearsal we read the William Byrd Suite, which is kind of funny because um, I ended up doing early music. But I I still remember like what it felt like, what it sounded like to have this group of people and everyone really cared about it and wanted to be there. And they all practiced and wanted to make something amazing. And right. I still remember the very first notes and I was thinking, I don't know how or what but I want to do this as much as I can for mm -hmm. as long as I can. So you were drawn to like the social feeling of like, because in, in public school, a lot of times every activity you do, like half the people are just trying to sabotage it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like in middle school band or even high school band, half the people are literally scheming on how they could drive the teacher crazy. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Like, I know in my trumpet section in middle school and high school, kids would purposely loosen their valve caps to make, like, loud clicking noises. And then they play oh, yeah. dumb when you call them out on it kind of stuff, you know? I was just mm -hmm. teaching a lesson now, and I said to the kid, I was like, I know you're not trying. It's just really annoying. I <laughs> just know that I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it. I yeah. know what this looks like. <laughs> You've done it to me many times. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So I had the same experience yeah, even I, just doing like a musical. I, I was like, oh, everyone is collaborating and wants to be here. That energy is like really cool. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I don't think I've I've necessarily thought of it that way. You know, in my head, I kind of imagined that it was it was that collective sound. Mm -hmm. But I think I think you're on onto a smart point that um that it's it's that act of uh, having us all be together doing the thing, mm -hmm. and and when I think of you know my like favorite memories of you know maybe playing concerts or or rehearsals, which for the most part don't tell the audience, <laughs> but <laughs> sometimes the rehearsals are way more fun and interesting because people I funny? don't know yeah. take more chances. Very true, yeah. Yeah, and 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 really, like, um, I don't know. I feel like sometimes we listen more to each other. Yeah, I, th there's something about the energy, and it can be the reverse too. Like, I've had plenty of concert cycles where the rehearsals are awfully boring, and then for some weird reason, something's right in the air on the night of the concert, and some magic comes together. And um, 
I think we were talking about this in in the first episode we recorded about that feeling. It's in like in an orchestra. There's sort of like this um, energy that spreads where people are like, I'm really focused. And then like everyone around them gets focused and it spreads. And all of a sudden the whole orchestra is just on point. The togetherness is really together. The the energy is just all unified. And and then sometimes it's the opposite of that where you're just like, what's happening? <laughs> like. Yeah, totally. Everyone's out to lunch and we're still here we are playing this concert like <laughs> <laughs> yeah sort of on autopilot yeah. Yeah. Do you find there's less of that in the early music world than there is cuz I see it a lot in the just more standard classical like symphony orchestra world where you can kind of get that like unengaged but still get all the notes out type of playing and I just see more of that visceral energy from early music, but I could just be biased with, I haven't heard enough. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, and and it's tough for me because I don't, um, I just don't do the modern thing much anymore at all. Um, but I don't know. I feel like, I feel like the thing about, at least for me, it with early music is so much of it, even in a larger thing, like something like Messiah, it it still has that sense of chamber music mm -hmm. of, of like having a conversation and, and really, uh, you know, it's a, it's a smaller unit type thing. Yeah. And maybe that's partly why there's more sense of engagement because it's one on a part and yeah. everyone has a sense that, they're contributing to their part. Yeah, their contribu their contribution is like pretty crucial. You know, if they're having a bad night, there's no one else playing second violin or something like. <laughs> right. Yeah, or trumpet. <laughs> or yeah. I don't think there's such a thing as having a bad night playing Messiah for trumpet. <laughs> I mean, there definitely it's... is, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, in in, in some ways. <laughs> How many times do you think you played Messiah? Have you ever calculated it? Oh my gosh, wow. I mean, it's definitely the piece that I've performed more than anything else. And I mean, every season I do usually at least, I don't know, in the neighborhood of 20 performances of it. <laughs> and so that, I mean, sometimes it's a little less. Um, I think actually the most I've ever done in in like one like Christmas time, not counting springtime messiahs, but I think the most I did was 18 or maybe maybe 19 but anyway it was a lot <laughs> i think you um, called it a messiah marathon right yeah i think so it feels like that it has a sort of groundhog day um aspect to it where where you're like wait did we already do the a section or yeah. you know uh, is is there a repeat or did we already do it or memories blur together <laughs> right from different like, wait, was this the one where we're not taking the repeat or was it, you know? Totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, probably over my career, I mean, I, I'm not a math, um, I'm not a math expert, but, you know, roughly 15 times 20. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'll let you do, I'll let you figure that out. <laughs> Yanka, 15 times 20. Come on. <laughs> nope. I'm the last person on earth. <laughs> I haven't been. <laughs> She's just trying to make me look good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I have a question here um, for listeners that are not familiar with early music. Um, I have seen how much work, like um, kind of preparation goes into it pre-performance, um, I think compared to other um, eras of music. Um, I, I see Luke like reading extensively, researching, and then like I know books. about your yeah lessons <laughs> and everything. So I was just curious, um, what is your routine about like preparing for a performance, like what? Do you, where do you go? What are your sources? Like, where are the things that you do before the notes? Like, I would say, yeah. Well, you know, I think it depends. It depends, obviously, on the piece and if it's, you know, we were just talking about Messiah, but and I, of course, I play it all the time. But every year before Messiah season, I'm always I'm always trying to read more, mm -hmm. learn more. Um, understand the piece in in a larger context. So, you know, I'll I'll look at the typical sources, um, early music sources, like specific things about articulation. You know, like the quants, or you know, I'll read things like that, or 
I'll I'll just go to my buddy Jay store and uh, see see what the more more current articles mm-hmm. yeah. are about whatever piece or composer or time period or um, genre. And surprisingly enough, there's a lot of good um, jumping off points. Yeah. On Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I love the Wikipedia rabbit hole phenomena where like. You just get totally. lost. All the mm-hmm. like every time I start research, all of a sudden I'm reading about like the Middle Ages unrelated to music, and I'm like, oh crap, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but and, you know it's a good thing, and yeah, I think um, for me, and I guess until I started studying early music, the concept of trying to understand what their lives were like um, for the music that that we're performing, I, it just didn't occur to me that that was um, something I should explore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think like, how how better can you try to understand how a piece of art works uh, than to try to um, put yourself in in the shoes of the people who lived and, and were observing art yeah. at that time. Which is hard, not only because it's hard, like it, you ha- but it's kind of disturbing to do. Like you have to really be like, "Oh my gosh, human beings, what were they up to?" <laughs> like, <laughs> totally. like when you try to imagine like Bach's life, like like not just like yeah, he was like you know that sixteen seventeen hundreds whatever, but like be like y- you wake up and what do you do? You know, and yeah. and at that level of detail of like, or as we've talked about in our lessons dealing with Bach, like you know, the role of religion today versus back then, so different. And when you really imagine that, all of a sudden Bach's music starts to make way more sense. Before that, I was like, yeah, Bach is that cool composer with the really complex voice leading that we learned about in school and didn't really connect to the spiritual element of it until I started imagining, like, what would I believe? You know, you can arrogantly think, course i would be an atheist in the 1700s too you know like but it's like no you probably wouldn't because that word didn't exist <laughs> yeah well and just conceptually like so many ways of thinking you know i i'm sure we've talked about this before but like the the concept of of crops failing mm-hmm. was was a religious issue mm-hmm. <laughs> for for people instead of one that has something to do with science and you know i suppose there are people who might argue that that hasn't changed. Yeah. And, and who am I to say? I don't know how crap. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, if, yeah. Have you ever played the counterfactual game of like, what would you be if you weren't a musician? Or is that just like a, I can't even go there kind of thing? <laughs> no, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I suppose I would probably do other sorts of things that aren't, um, financially sound (laughs) but but are really fascinating uh i remember an anthropology class that i took in undergrad and it was a it was a survey of of general um you know all of the different uh specific fields within anthropology and um I remember thinking, even at the time, like, man, if I weren't completely sold on doing music, this, this is fascinating. Like, mm-hmm. cultural anthropology and linguistics and, um, yeah, archaeology. And, of course, comes to fi- come to find out, you know, about 10 years later, I start doing early music, which in so many ways is like cultural anthropology. Yeah. Me too, yeah. Right. And it and, and, you know, the linguistics part, like you have to know you have to know the way that um, Italian or that Latin was pronounced in Italian speaking countries versus German. Mm-hmm. And what are those differences? And, you know, all of those all of those little details, which hopefully you can help make make music come to life in a way that's more um, meaningful yeah, for you and for the audience. Yeah. It's like every point of connection you can make, even if it's not directly applying to what you're playing, is it just makes something more meaningful. And it's not like the audience knows how much you know about Bach necessarily. Like it's not right there literally, but it's in the feeling of like you will play it differently when you have all those points of connection to the repertoire you're playing. And I feel like that's just not trained as much in the regular standard you know conservatory classical training um i mean it might be 
gestured at, but it's more of like, yeah, it's a gesture. And now let's get back to the main idea, which is playing in tune and playing your scales and all yeah. that, you know? Very true. Yeah. Well, you know, that goes, goes to the question of like, what do I do for preparation? And I think, um, I think, I think that is, is equally important as like how to, how to uh, gain enough endurance to play through these crazy trumpet parts. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's just as important to have that kind of um, mental endurance and, and just the, just curiosity for goodness sake, you know, I think, yeah, I think that's one of the things that needs to be cultivated so much more because by being curious, uh, you start to ask questions and by asking questions, you you learn so much more than than if you just think you already know how it's supposed to go and then you just or you copy what someone else did yeah and not that copying is wrong because we all do it as part of the learning but yeah curiosity is like do you remember um our first well i guess we only went together to the colbert report once but neil yes, degrasse tyson was that. the guest of course i remember that i think i was um a freshman in college or something and somehow I had not heard of Neil deGrasse Tyson yet, but his, his shtick is all about like, we are born curious. We are creatures that just want to explore around us. Like look at kids and how they just mess with things and break things and knock the pots and pans down. And, and then it gets programmed out of us. Like, here's how the world works. And then stop that curiosity. It's going to make you, it's going to put you in danger. It's going to, you know, <laughs> distract you from becoming a good little businessman and starting a good little family, you know, like. It, you just kind of get programmed out of it. But I found like that's totally what motivates my research when I'm doing early music stuff is like just that I just want to know. Like it's just curiosity. Yeah. Maybe it's like a primitive that comes with the hard drive, you know? Yeah, but I think I think that gets at the point that you were asking about earlier too about, um, you know, what, what drives people to to do a certain thing and – you know, even when you were when you were a young lad playing lacrosse, you know, you were you were probably curious about, you know, how let's see, how consistent can I be with um, catching or mm -hmm. I don't know if, what the term is for. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do the uh, lacrosse lac podcast next. <laughs> All right, exactly. I assume you studied up for that. <laughs> Um, oh, of course not at all. <laughs> well, you knew the word catch. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, there you go. But yeah, I think that, I think that curiosity is really the sort of thing that, um, that keeps us interested or else, you know, like who else would like play or yeah, I guess like play the same piece every year, week after week after week, um, without, without it getting i don't know old or boring i i yeah i don't quite know what boring means so have you I heard of the that. um the concept from zen buddhism like beginner's mind i forget the the other word for it yeah it's it's um uh uh zen mind beginner's mind or yeah that, that's the name of the book i think um right and uh i, I forget that I, I guess it would be a japanese word it's like the suzuki guy that wrote it i think yeah um but, I can't think of the word. Uh, I I just saw it recently, and it starts with like a, an S H, I think. Anyways, that that's how I approach. Like if I play a piece that I played all the time, you have to or just hear hear a piece. Like sometimes I'll go on a walk during the sunset, and like a piece will come on, and depending on the mood I'm in, I'll hear it with that beginner's mind of like, oh wow, this is like crazy. Like the the sound just hits you, and it's just like harmony. Whoa, a chord, you know. Whereas if it hit me, like when I'm just in the car, distracted, running late, I'll be like, turn that Bach off. It's too loud. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So there's just a way you can actually practice having beginner's mind by just reminding yourself like, okay, what did I, how did I experience Mahler's fifth symphony when I was in high school and how do I experience it now? Like there's, do you know, hedonic adaptation? Like that's the fancy no. word for like in psychology, your body, like the physiology adapts to the experiences you have. So you don't have the reaction anymore. So like my first time hearing Mahler, um, you're just overwhelmed. You could cry. You have the goosebumps. And then that doesn't stick around forever, but you can sort of get back there a little bit if you practice that beginner's mind thing, I think. 
as a performer or as a player. I mean, or as a, a yeah. listener. Yeah, for sure. And I think I think especially a powerful piece like Messiah, not to constantly talk about Messiah, but well, you have played it fourteen times, twenty times. Right. <laughs> exactly. So but I I think what's I think the reason why people come back and hear it every year is that it's sort of like one on one level, it it's sort of a way to check in with yourself, like, you know, sort of New Year's resolution or you know, you can imagine how your life has changed or stayed the same since last year when you came to hear it or play mm. it. And and I also think of whenever I play it, like I I like to imagine that there are people, this will be their first time hearing it, mm. and there'll be this will be their last time hearing it. That, and that next year I won't see one, them. Yeah. You know, and and it and especially because the trumpet part is about everlasting life and resurrection, you know, the, the trumpet shell sound aria. Right. I, I just feel like I want to try to tap into those kind of that personal relationship with the music that hopefully um, gets reflected to the audience as well. And I think it is obvious, like she, she, uh, Yanka came down to the Stoughton Festival. I think that's the first time you heard her playing, right? Yeah. And yeah, you exude something different than a lot of trumpet players. Mm -hmm. I think, would you agree there's somewhat of a problem specifically in the trumpet world of technique being elevated above all the stuff you're talking about, like expression and artistry? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just because it's such a beast, you know? Yeah. It's it's such... It's so much harder than violin. <laughs> <laughs> just ignore what you said. <laughs> <laughs> just forget he said that. I mean, he's totally right. <laughs> <laughs> truth is truth. But anyways, go on. Sorry. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, I mean, at least the, like the things that that we need to do, like the consistency and the accuracy are are things that um that are simple but difficult and and I think it's it's really easy to focus your whole being on making sure that you don't make mistakes or that mm -hmm. you're super accurate and you know and I think that's kind of where that that whole thing comes from um yeah. because you know nobody wants to make a big mistake in the middle of a concert for example at the volume Although of I a trumpet. Like to think of it <laughs> What's that? At the volume of a trumpet, because everyone will hear that mistake. Everyone will hear it. But, you know, my my response to that is that I am just showing a reflection of my humanity and that we are all <laughs> we are all capable of failing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> if if it, 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 like, I think I was gesturing at that earlier, the randomness part, like it's when you are cool with the possibility of failure that you actually find more free performances. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think actually that's, that's, um, that's probably why, why we tend to see more um, brass playing that is a little more careful. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, there are people who don't play that way. Like, if you want to go listen to some old recordings or watch some videos of Rolf Smedvig um, mm -hmm. in, in the old heyday of Empire Brass and that entire ensemble, it still, it still just lights my brain on fire when I, when I watch them play and, and see how committed they all were to to what they're playing. And, and I think that was just such an, a big influence. Yeah. You know, even before doing early music, like that's how I want to play. Yeah. That mm -hmm. commitment thing. Like there's such, there's a seriousness that certain people have when they play that it's like, this is how it goes. Trust me. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, totally. And you totally have that. Like that was my first time on Baroque trumpet playing in a section with you this past summer. And yeah, that's the energy when a, when a, a leader of a section is is leading in that way not just like here's exactly where the notes go with the rhythm or something but this is how it goes like music yes everybody can sync up to that and i think 
one of the reasons trumpet players have tend to have the stereotype of big egos is because we are loud, we're often in the back, and our sound is not just for the other trumpets to follow, but also for the orchestra to follow. How we yeah. release the sound and, and all of the, those subtle details, people hear it just by the nature of the instrument. Yeah, and I, that was uh, just because you mentioned it. It was it was so cool uh, to to get an opportunity to play together in in that way. Yeah, it um, was trippy a little bit. With <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I bet. I mean, uh, well, plus I and, had and, seen and you for in, me in too. Fair amount. I I forget what we said it was, but it was at least six years or something like that. Like we had had online lessons, but um, I don't think. I, we had seen each other for six years, five years, something like that. Yeah. Not online. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I have a question here. Um, it, yeah. It was the last first time I saw you playing last year, last summer in Stanton Music Festival. And what I loved about, I think, your interpretation is like, I think you had a perfect balance of how much of your personality comes through your playing. And then also it was so effortless. And I think my question is like, how do you, because for some people, like when I'm watching them performing, there's a lot of ego showing. And then it's more like for the sake of expressing, like pe like impressing people, not expressing. So I was just mm. curious, how do you find a nice balance of showing personality, but just also staying so humble? Like you, I think do that really well. Well, you're so kind. Um, for a trumpet player. <laughs> yeah, right, for a trumpet player. I mean, honestly, I think that um, I, I and, and this is probably going to sound like, I don't know, like a canned response or something, but I, I let the music take over, you know? I, I really want as much as I possibly can to just be a vessel for the music. Mm -hmm. and and however i can you know there there are many times when i i kind of just want my whole self to disappear and and have the only thing left is is whatever sound is happening or you know the idea of what it is that i want to express and i just i kind of want myself to just completely not even be part of it I see. Okay. I yeah. hope it gets easier, like, the more you <laughs> perform, because that's something that I've been really struggling with lately, I guess, personally. It's hard. To, You're in audition yeah. mode, too. I think that's it's harder so to true, do that yeah. in audition mode, you know, it's like, where you're just, yeah. you're literally aware that there are people behind yeah. a curtain that are that's true. judging your technique not just your musicality. Yeah, it's like playing you're playing guitar hero or something. Like you're just hitting <laughs> the right buttons at the right time. It started turning into that and it's very frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Oh no, I can I, I think you're totally right. And I and I know I've I've talked with um, my students, but see, since I'm practically ancient, um I I don't have that same um I, you know, I'm not doing auditions. It's a different thing when you're already out and playing and, and such. But um, but yeah, that whole audition thing and f finding a way to uh, to not care what anyone thinks. Yeah. <laughs> and and, it, the, and there's like a good version of that and a bad version of that, you know? And oh, for sure. People mistake those, I think. But the good version is like you're not scared of their judgment in the sense that like i want to impress them you know yes it's more like um yeah. i i don't care in that sense because like th th there's a weird sense of like you care and you don't care like you know like <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. i know i know well yeah i guess um i guess part of you know some of the advice that i give for my students is to just um you know st stay focused on on what what it what it is you want to say like what is the message what what is the um story that you're there to tell mm. and if you can if you can stay focused on that 
then usually the idea of someone else's judgment won't even be part of the conversation. Yeah, not mm-hmm. in the moment, at least. Maybe right, exactly. in the hotel room yeah. afterwards when you're reflecting, you know, <laughs> all of those thoughts come flooding, but yeah. Yeah, or, you know, like me, you know, 20 years later. <laughs> you'll <laughs> yeah. Well, you will be thinking about that one note or... <laughs> Yanka's weird like that. She can tell you after a performance, she's like, you know, Damn it, in measure 37, that F sharp was like a quarter tone I'm sharp, not or you know, like <laughs> that specific, but I can tell mostly, which is not healthy, I think. I I'll be like, how'd that, that audition go? She's like, three notes were sharp. I'm like, huh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I'm not that but... shallow, please. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, it's a compliment no, that you I have mean... more of that perfect pitch, like, you know, ability to analyze what you're doing and that's why you yeah. what what like her standard of what oh i sucked is like i'm still amazing you know <laughs> like but um <laughs> no. what i think what you're getting at is getting like, it so wrong it's okay you every audition you take you say else. that that sucked and then it you, and you end up winning it or something like <laughs> oh, no. okay i have nothing to say about this um, Kodawari. <laughs> I always aim for better. Yeah. I don't know. Last, do you know that quote? There you it, go. It, uh, <laughs> last year, a foolish monk. This year, no change. <laughs> no. I forget. Who, I, it's like it's from some Japanese poem, but like I think about it all the time. Like pretty much every year, I go, "Man, I sucked that trumpet last year." <laughs> and then the next year, no change. <laughs> <Yeah>. You know. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Which is either really well, good or it's... bad. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just like what we were talking about earlier, too, our our curve kind of changes over time. And, you know, I, I think as as someone who's um, further down the road than you are in age, for example, um, <laughs> I, you know, I was trying to be creative and not say how older. old I feel. <laughs> or even the word <laughs> but, older. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. But, um, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like at least for me, a lot of things have changed in terms of what, what I value. And, and that's probably just where you are too, you know, being a perfectionist or a recovering perfectionist, um, I think is, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's that perfectionism that often, leads us on the path to to being great at something. But then, at least for me, I find that it 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 doesn't help me um go to the next level because it it's really just sort of a um a more of a hindrance um yeah. that and 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 so I try to turn it around and think of you know, I'm looking for perfection of intent or perfection of um of process Mm -hmm. as opposed to the thinking about the result yeah yeah we were really great advice in the in the um first episode we did just talking about this concept of kodawari like pursuing perfection knowing you can't get there yet you still pursue it we were saying how like you can't ever, that's a good value but you can never have a value without some counterbalance value that keeps it in check because otherwise you spin out of control and become a perfectionist in the negative sense. And for musicians, I think that counterbalance is the musical message, like being an artist, not a technician. Yep. Or at least using using the technique only only as a tool. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or, you know, the technical mind, using that technical mind, because it's it's not like you want to throw it all away. Um, because you need some of that, but I think finding finding a way to reconcile the the two sides of uh, technical thought and musical thought or intent, yeah. and trying to as much you know, and I think yeah, part of that is uh, finding a new way to erase yourself and get it to be about the music. Yeah, you sort of have to rewrite your source code of like, what's my prime directive here as a musician? Was there an age that that shifted for you? Um, I mean, I would have, that's a tough question, Luke. 
Um, I mean, not an exact number, but like a a sort of period of life, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, so often I feel like everything points back to the to the discovery for myself of early music and performance Mm -hmm. practice. Um, but I'm sure there were other places along the way. And I think it's, it's a matter of getting an influence from a teacher. Like I remember my first private teacher in high school, like I was a junior and, um, you know, it's just, it's the idea of like opening up a new level of, of, you know, you think, you think, you know, kind of what you're doing and then you meet an influence or a teacher or hear someone play. And then you realize, Oh, wow. Yeah. There's the level up mm-hmm. moment. There's so many layers above this. Yeah. You thought you were um, looking down one road that's like, yeah, I know what's down there. And then you, someone's like, no, no, you got to come 10 feet more this way. And then look and you're like, whoa, OK, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I hope hopefully I think that's I think that's kind of how it's supposed to be. Like we're we're supposed to be influenced by um, people that we come, come across and, and just like as a teacher, I'm influenced by students of mine all the time. Like, here's a perfect example of this, (laughs) this conversation, you know, seriously. Yeah, Yeah, totally. What was, um, that was one of the questions I had written down, like how has teaching affected how you approach being a musician? Cause I know a lot of musicians who just never really got into teaching. I sort of fell into it because it it just sort of took off while I was in school and a a studio got built up and I didn't necessarily think it would be important or not but I just it was like I was like hey cool this is a way to make money without having to like work at a restaurant while in college or something Um, and now when I Mm -hmm. reflect back I think I wouldn't be I wouldn't understand music the way I do if I had not had to teach it and still like teaching i i think as annoying as it can be with with bad students um it forces you to you know just articulate what you think in a different way i don't know what it is did, did that have an effect on you or like when did you start teaching well my first students were actually when i was still in high school oh wow <laughs> so <laughs> so um i think i got five dollars a lesson whoa <laughs> <laughs> Which back in the olden days, that was a pretty big sum note. But um, yeah, so teaching, you know, I guess even when I was a kid, like before taking music, like whenever I had like cousins around and stuff, I always wanted to like play school or, you mm-hmm. know, so I guess teaching has always kind of been in my, in my blood. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was it was during undergrad, especially when I had a, a large stable of students. And I mean, we're talking about like, I had at least 20 something students um, mm-hmm. during undergrad. And, and then in, in during my master's degree, I had like 50. Um, mostly oh, half gosh. hours, though. But I know. Still, it's 50 categories 50, of things yeah. to think about. <laughs> <laughs> 50 different people. And yeah. Yeah, I feel like I feel like of anything that that I've done as a musician, I feel like the teaching has informed me more than anything. I feel like it's been yeah. it's helped me to like um understand the imaginations of other people or at least attempt to. Mm-hmm. Um to try to understand other people's experience or um, the way the way some people see things um, and how to how to try to get into different characters and different people's heads so that I can understand how to help them best. Yeah. And I feel like that that gives you a little bit of, um, I don't know, like uh, vocabulary of being an actor as a performer. Yeah. You know, to try to get in touch with these different characters that you need to express. Right. Because as as players, like, and I use that language all the time with students, I'll say, okay, if what you are playing right now is like a book or a play or something, 
what character came out just now? And they might not have ever thought that like a piece of music could have different characters. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, we have to represent this character with our sound somehow. Um, we can't write about him and say yeah. this tall person with dark hair, this, you know, you have to, so how do we change? And, and it just gets them thinking like, oh, music is a story. And that's what I, it always comes down back to. I think for me, it's like, I have to remember like human beings where we're, our, our minds evolved to to understand reality through story and that's why music's so good at telling story because it's not specifics it's not like billy went here and susie ate an apple you know <laughs> like i mean it yeah. could be but i i think like when you listen to a Mahler symphony like it's working on those like deeper subconscious layers of storytelling and you know i don't know every time i go back and listen to a Mahler symphony for example i'll connect to the story with the new life details that that I have in my head currently, but it still fits because if you have a deep story, a deep truth, like it works for all the things upstream that might be current in your life or the other two thousand people in the concert hall, that's not going to happen for a couple <laughs> six months. But yeah, right, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think it comes down to that story thing, and teaching certainly helps. I don't know. Yanka might have a different opinion because she's teaching way too much right now, like online lessons. Uh, she yeah, took over some so studios. Much. Yeah. Not eight, not I know, after online the fifth hour. <laughs> yeah. No, it gets really tough, but no, I mean, I think after I started teaching and like I was verbally able to express something that I was doing was the first time that I actually understood how I'm doing like bow technique and stuff. Like those are such complicated concepts and violin and I improved so much, mm. like about technical aspects, like once I started speaking them to someone else, which was, yeah, my Absolutely. biggest discovery. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like, you don't know what you think until you have to say it kind of thing, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, so there's an element of like, there's an element of like, I need, to, like, sometimes I have this like sort of meta awareness while I'm teaching where I go, like, I, I kind of want to know how I complete this thought because I'm trying to describe something about how air and the vibration of something and i'm kind of like curious what the brain thinks and then i'm like wait i am my brain and then i'm like wait am i and then i'm like no you're teaching pay attention <laughs> 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 but yeah i think yeah. you definitely i remember you said that to me she started teaching maybe three years ago yeah three four years ago and I guess. and especially since english was her uh, relatively new at that point like that made it even harder to communicate musical ideas which are so yeah abstract and like sure. you know but they both helped each other so much I, my english got so much better after i started teaching and also definitely like teaching got so much easier after i started speaking english properly so yeah what's the yeah. best memory you've had on the performer side of a concert and then like also on the listener side of a concert Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. Or whatever one pops into your head from that prompt, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think especially it's that's such an interesting question, especially right now, because because of the no concerts. And and I alluded to that earlier, but it's sort of um, it's it, it almost feels like a dream, you know, that 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 we used to do such things. Um, I mean, one that really sticks out. Uh, off the top of my head was a uh, a tour that I got to do with a, a Renaissance band in my early days of of my early music um, career, and we were in Salamanca, Spain, and we got to play in this little chapel that was built in 1100. Oh wow! <laughs> and we were doing a a reconstruction of a Renaissance mass, and so. I got to play, I got to start the whole concert with a trumpet call mm -hmm. that I devised, you know, looking at sources from the time. And, and uh, I sort of did a reconstruction of what a trumpet might sound like. Um, and just hearing, I don't know, hearing my sound um, bounce off of these walls where so many people have walked and and listened and been a part of and and who knows you know how many funerals or weddings or yeah uh 
you know, events, baptisms or whatever. Um, and that it just it it kind of floored me, actually. That. One of those step back moments you see, like, not just your life. You're like, whoa, I'm part of this giant thing that is quite mysterious. But, you know, yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Sometimes I'll get that same feeling just looking at the stars. It's that like I'm in a universe like what, you know, in <laughs> yeah. this case, it's like I'm participating in history like, you know, the, but you said it's from yeah. 1100 you were yeah i think yeah i think the chapel was built in 1100 I like mean, that's an e easy year to read in a book you know it's a one one zero zero like <laughs> but to like sure. connect with it viscerally is pretty intense yeah yeah what yeah, about as an easy. attendee of a concert gosh um you know in my mind the the things that i go to are i think they were the concerts that i that i went to um, as an undergrad at Michigan, we had this rush ticket program and, and all of the seats were five bucks. Nice. And that's one and trumpet lesson. Really nice, <laughs> yeah. And there's a really nice concert hall on campus and lots of really big groups from all over. Um, like I heard Chicago Symphony there. I heard um, it was a Russian orchestra doing um, Beethoven 7. And I remembered thinking, I've never heard that many people play so softly mm. and it's blowing my mind, you know? Mm. And, you know, one of the other things that I remember from that series, the, um, you know, like the student tickets, um, this was before I was, I, uh, before I, would, I had played any period instruments, but I went to hear and see uh, Mark Morris's um, ballet of, um, or, you know, dance, dance troupe, uh, setting of Purcell's Dido and Aeneas. And I had just never seen anything or heard anything like it. Mm. And I, as soon as it was over, I bought a ticket to go back the next day. <laughs> nice. That's a and good, I, that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was sort of that, it was during, it was during that semester that I was taking a performance practice class. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, you were that, like, I that, need to see that again and just get more data. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just so beautiful and it, yeah, it just really set, it set me on fire. Like I hadn't, I hadn't felt that way in a while. Yeah. I remember, um, what it was at, I think New York city opera, we saw King Arthur, King I Arthur. guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on modern instruments, you know, it's a whatever, it's okay, but... Um, I know, you probably had to suffer <clears throat> through me explain, you know, or uh, being annoyed by that. <laughs> no, I, that was Mark Morris, right? Sorry about that. We, we were, we were, I think we enjoyed it. Yes, it was. <laughs> Plenty. <laughs> um, was Mark oh, Morris yeah. still at Tanglewood doing that thing when you were there? I don't think oh, so. Oh, he used to do, like, they used to, like, have him come to Tanglewood and, like, choreograph, like, whatever pieces you were working on. Because I think that's a big thing mm -hmm. in the early music world is, like tying what you're doing to the visual motion of dance and mm -hmm. uh, yep. like it, it totally <sighs> blows your mind to like what different styles of baroque music or music generally like like the visual of it is what made it make sense for me yeah for sure yeah yeah and i think in in my imagination so often when i'm playing playing music any music there's some sort of even though even though I have zero training in dance, mm -hmm. I I see I see the gestures happen in my head. Yeah, hmm. yeah, that's yeah. It's it's like um half visual, half like the feel of it. Like I could imagine the the like the um the gravity feel of it, sort of. You know, like yeah, like the weight of a the weight of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, totally. So you ready for bonus questions? Oh sure, I always love a bonus. <laughs> so the, you could you you know speed round or not, feel free to take you know a minute or five seconds. But you know, okay, just a few quick ones to end us here. Uh, we'll see. Who's your favorite composer and why? I <laughs> you mean, know, in ten seconds. you have to say <laughs> it has to be Bach. Come on, <laughs> like I don't know. It's uh, it's a hard question, and, and then I'm like, speechless. Yeah. yeah, that's why. Oh, good, nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> uh let's see what what did you believe 10 years ago that you no longer believe now hmm 
I, uh, or the, or you can flip that and just be like, how, what's a belief that's changed over the last 10 years? Well, I think that, that life is, is going to be its thing. And yes, you can be prepared, but I don't, I don't think we can necessarily plan how things go. Yeah. I mean, that's a big one for me, especially the last 10 years Yeah, of my life. Yeah, there's a sort of like, um, what's the expression? Just lift up your legs and float downstream. <laughs> you know, like so many people are on their life raft, like grabbing to the sides, trying to re- grab a branch or something. And it's just like, there's such a freedom in being like, I'm going with the stream. Not not in the sense that, that, you know, you're going with things that feel wrong or something, but just like y- the wisdom, I guess, is knowing when should you let go of a branch and when should you hold on to it or something. But I found Very as deep. I get older, the same thing, like letting go is way more valuable than grabbing on tight. And- <laughs> oh, yeah. man, that that there you go. The wisdom of youth. Well, I'm only 30, so what am I going to say when I'm 40? I'm pretty freaking scared. <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah. Well. Maybe I'll be like, I used to think it was about letting go. Now it's about holding on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, what can you remember about the time you laughed the hardest? Or like what memory pops into your head from that? You know, I mostly think of uh, a good friend of mine who's a, a fabulous conductor and we would find ourselves laughing about things um, and not not even being able to remember why. And having it go so far that we don't even know what we were laughing at. I mean, oh, I think okay. that's, that's the real thing. Yanka has this best friend named, uh, back in Turkey named Seda. And for some reason, when they get together, that's all that happens. And nobody else knows yeah, what's going on. <laughs> we don't know why either yet. That's that's like kind of literally that's for kind of my hours. Friend, um, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everybody has that friend, I guess. That happens. I do too. I, I guess yeah. communicate without even talking. Yeah, like you just like make the right eye contact, and like you thought you were recovered, and nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. There's no explanation for it, but that's what's good about laughter. It's sort of like when something's ridiculous enough, you their words wouldn't capture it anyway. So let's just make laughing sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So without naming any names or situations, what's the most ridiculous thing you've ever encountered as being a performer <laughs> while being a performer? Oh, oh man. Um, let's see. Because me and Yanka, at, at, certainly at this point in our lives, we still do the kind of gigs where we're like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Is this really happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, um, I think I think the thing that I can think of, and and like I said, no specifics, but um, it was a matter of like um, where we had to we had to make sure that we had the three things we needed to have: the correct instrument, the correct music, and the correct location that we needed to be, because there were sometimes you know we would play play something up in the balcony. And you needed to have a cornetto and you're going to play this music. And then you would have to go down into the, uh, you know, onto the stage and then Mm -hmm. make sure that you had your trumpet and this other music and make sure that you didn't mix those things up so that you didn't have your trumpet up in the balcony and, you know. Right, right. (laughs) That kind of thing. And was that successfully (laughs) managed? (laughs) Yeah, I think it, I think we, if I recall, we had like a scorecard. Okay. And and I think most people ended up okay, but you know sometimes that that's not how that works. And then and you see someone across this, you know, like downstairs when they're supposed to be upstairs and it's supposed to happen, and you know that kind of thing. <laughs> or you ever be like you're sitting second trumpet or something, and you look over and you're like, all right, I don't want to be the guy to poke the principal trumpet. And say, you know, you your part's coming up, but I'm not sure they know. What do I do? <laughs> like, or they're holding the yeah, wrong that's... instrument. You know, they think they're holding their C trumpet, but it's a different trumpet. You know, stuff like that. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I've seen that. I mean, we all have those. We all know those colleagues who 
you're just always you're like, should I send an extra text to remind them like this is on Baroque instruments or something like that? <laughs> like, totally. Or do I need to remind them that that they're coming to this concert today? You know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 They're in a different place. Yeah, it for better or worse. Sometimes it's like, hey, I want to go visit wherever you're you're hanging out. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. But yeah, I think both of our personalities, Yanka too, we're both like. It, when there's something like that coming up, we go into a different mode of like, I've never forgotten my passport on the way to the airport. You know, like yeah. I would never could have met, <laughs> knock on wood. Yeah, right. <laughs> we might as well. <laughs> um, whereas like I had an old roommate that uh, was like flying to Croatia or something and just like kind of left the house all like do 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 <laughs> and then got to Jamaica, was on the air train to JFK and was like, shit, my passport. And I'm like, how does that happen? Like, that's the one the one thing that will yeah. stop you from traveling. Yeah. You could forget I mean, anything else. Of, exactly. That's the sort of <clears throat> stuff I have dreams about or nightmares. You right. Know? Yeah, Do you ever have the mouthpiece dreams where you go to play oh. and the mouthpiece isn't there? <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Or it's the wrong mouthpiece or like there's something stuck in the mouthpiece or yeah. especially with trumpet, all the different parts and pieces and I don't know how many times I will be on the way to the airport and I will stop and pull over and even though I just looked at what was in my case <laughs> yeah it's like the the old keys wallet phone you're just tapping make sure they're all there <laughs> totally totally because yeah. you just know like it's it's gonna ruin everything like yeah if 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 I don't have my mouthpiece best case scenario someone else has one but it's gonna feel so different than yours and it yeah <laughs> I, I'm the same way. I, even though I know I double checked it, I'll I'll check again. Yeah, it's obsessive. Um, well, where can uh, people find you? Um, what's your website? It's just your name, right? Chris Quapis. It is dot com just, or org or yeah, Chris Quapis dot com. Yeah, cool. Check out. I'll link it in the episode notes. But ch there's a section on the website with um, your paintings too. Awesome. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Um, anything else? I think we covered everything. Cool. That's we solved questions. all the mysteries of the universe. Yeah. Oh, it only took about an hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll hit, I'll hit stop on the recording and then we can just say goodbye off air. Okay, perfect. That sounds good. All right. <laughs> all right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Exploring Kodawari. If you enjoyed it, we hope you'll consider sharing it on social media and with friends. You can also help us out by leaving a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Those help us more than you would think. And if you'd like to help us out in a more substantial way, consider going over to our website to make a donation through PayPal. Links are in the episode notes for this. You can do this as a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. All of that support will help us to set aside time in order to create content for the podcast and the blog. And finally, please get in touch with us and say hi, either on social media or privately through email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.